Hello, I'm Charo Neville, the curator of the Kamloops Art Gallery. I'm standing in uh, the exhibition Scott Massey, a, a Marker to Measure Drift, on until April 3rd. And Scott's going to take us through during this video and speak about each work. Um, the exhibition as a whole covers about 18 years of his practice. So it's a survey starting from an early work uh, that he made when he was in Emily Carr University. Um, Scott Massey is a BC-based artist. He's shown across the country. And this is the first time that all of these works have come together in one exhibition. And uh, so as he goes through, he'll be talking about the links in his practice, the underpinning of uh, the, the confluence of art and science in his work, the exploration of quantum physics and astrophysics, um, and then these deeper concerns around uh, the spiritual and our, our question of, of our own existence within these greater contexts. Hi, my name is Scott Massey. I'm the artist currently exhibiting at the Kamloops Art Gallery uh, with my show uh, titled A Marker to Measure Drift. Uh, the show title is actually borrowed from a book by Alexander Maxik. And the, uh, the title refers to our changing perspectives uh, and our place in the universe as a whole. Uh, in pre-Copernican times, uh, it was believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. Of course, now we know that the Earth is spinning and uh, revolving around the sun uh, in our solar system. And uh, our solar system is moving around at a very far uh, outpost of the Milky Way galaxy, which in itself is also moving along with its local supergroup in the universe as a whole. So the title refers to both our uh, movement, constant movement through space, but it also refers to the uh, movement in our thinking from a very limited uh, anthropocentric worldview into a much larger cosmological universal view. So what drives my practice? I'm essentially interested in three main topics. Uh, quantum physics, which is talking about the very small. Astrophysics, which is talking about the very large. Both of these subjects inform the third important topic to me, which is cosmology. And cosmology is essentially interested in answering those really big questions. So what it all means, what we're doing here, what, it, what is the nature of existence? And you'll find that uh, the works throughout this show and my practice in general uh, reflect on uh, those ideas of grand scale uh, and our place within it. So my practice uh, essentially breaks down into two different uh, streams, uh, photography uh, essentially and also sculpture. But uh, the methodology with which I work, which is very exper experimental in nature, uh, means that there's often a lot of uh, cross-disciplinary uh, interactions between those uh, mediums. Um, this uh, work here um, is a great example of that kind of cross-disciplinary action. It's a sculpture, but it is in fact uh, primarily a photograph in many ways. So the work is called The Sun Was Born in Darkness to Shine for a Time Only to Return to Darkness. And essentially it is the very essence of photography. It is light acting directly on film. And you can see this action uh, happening right now. Uh, this work is comprised of a reconfigured rotary slide projector and inside uh, the lamp and uh, housings, uh, mechanics inside have been uh, uh, reconfigured uh, for a parabolic uh, lens, a uh, high intensity bulb and an aspherical lens which concentrates the heat and the light of that lens uh, directly onto the film plane at a very sharp uh, point. And the carousel is outfitted with uh, 100 processed but unexposed uh, transparency slide film, which means that they're black slides. So that's where we get the effect of having uh, the light start uh, bursting through and burning through uh, those slides as if a sun were exploding. This um, constant birthing of suns and uh, dying of suns that is sort of inherent in, in the uh, dialogues of this work really refers to this condition of actual suns going supernova, exploding out into space, and uh, spreading out uh, all the heavier elements that uh, eventually come together and form the things that we know about. The baryonic matter of the universe, which is the planets and other stars, and of course ourselves.
So as you make your way through this exhibition, uh, you'll notice that the sun as a reference point starts showing up in a lot of these works. And this uh, video piece here uh, is no exception. It's called uh, Light Adjustments, Center of the Universe. And it was actually shot on location at a place uh, deemed the center of the universe, not that far from Kamloops. Uh, in fact, uh, it was on uh, the uh, suggestion of the exhibition curator, Charo Neville, uh, for me to have a look at this site um, up by uh, an area uh, near Vedette Lake. And this video uh, starts out, as you just saw, with a very um, tight uh, telephoto close-up of the rising sun through the trees. And uh, throughout the entire rest of the video, the camera slowly zooms back uh, over the course of 24 hours, ending on uh, the sunrise the very next day. And what you'll see is that the sun the sun's position in the frame of the, of the video throughout the entire thing is, is exactly the same spot uh, from, from one sunrise to the following sunrise the next day. And in the middle of those times, uh, I have uh, enacted a bunch of activities uh, in front of the camera working with the lenses that uh, play with ideas of our perception of uh, the camera as an as a objective viewer, and uh, how uh, light can be manipulated and adjusted in, in, in many different ways to give you uh, uh, different readings on the landscape, as it were. So that the, the idea that there's one uh, perspective of, of a landscape is actually uh, rendered false uh, by all of these manipulations in front of the camera. The setting of, of this video uh, at the center of the universe, um, the way that uh, that came about was um, a uh, uh, Tibetan monk uh, was asked to come up to the Thompson Nicola region uh, back in the early 80s and investigate what uh, they felt was a powerful uh, presence uh, somewhere uh, in this region and they wanted to isolate its location. And so after a number of uh, field tests, uh, this Tibetan monk uh, returned uh, to San Francisco. And uh, not long after that, uh, about a dozen other um, uh, monks came up uh, to revisit the locations uh, that they were looking at. And they, I guess, ran a few more tests and uh, officially determined that, in fact, this area that the video was shot in, in fact, I'm standing right on it, uh, that it, what for them was deemed to be the center of the universe. Since my practice is so uh, firmly rooted in these ideas of exploration of our place in the universe, um, actually making a work at a place deemed to be the center of the universe was something I felt uh, was kind of necessary. The video <clears throat> came out of a number of uh, experiments uh, photographically, which uh, are uh, the works on the walls here called uh, uh, they're all under the heading of uh, spectrum studies, and uh, each of them is investigating uh, a different kind of um, photographic uh, perspective or a photographic uh, apparatus uh, manipulation. In some cases, uh, the photographs have been created with infrared film, or I have made custom ultraviolet lenses and, and other filtrations. You'll see with the black and white works uh, reference to Ansel Adams and his uh, zone system. So that's a bit of an uh, exposure uh, system that Ansel Adams developed, uh, which is kind of a little photo geeky. But uh, uh, we, you know, all of the works sort of refer to the uh, underlying apparatus of photography that we don't often think about, but in fact is, uh, is, a, is a wide open uh, field of, of experimentation, which uh, experimentation really underlies a lot of the essence of my practice. In talking about the two main thrusts of my practice being photographic and sculptural, and the idea that a lot of times these, uh, these uh, media overlap, uh, the works behind me that are part of the Spectrum Studies series informing the Light Adjustments video are a really great example of the way that um, I treat uh, photography and image, image making. And a big part of that experimental thrust is um, the idea of a, a corruption of the apparatus. So I rarely use a camera uh, as just a, a, a photographic tool. Um, 
a lot of the times I will uh, force the apparatus of photography, whether it's the camera or the lenses or the film, I'll force them to uh, do things they weren't necessarily intended for. And by doing that, I feel like I'm able to enter into a very different uh, visual language than straight photography would allow me to do. Many of the works in this exhibition uh, use the sun as a reference point. And in this main uh, area of the gallery, uh, that is very certainly the case. All of the works here, in some way, shape, or form, are dealing with uh, uh, the, the ideas of the sun or light as a medium that has a physical effect and a physical presence within the world. So uh, with this video here, uh, it's called Heat Equals Light Equals Heat uh, Egg. And um, essentially, I videoed a uh, vintage 1,000-watt uh, uh, mogul-based tungsten light. Light and heat are all, all exist uh, on the electromagnetic spectrum, and that's what this work attempts to discuss. It, uh, a thousand watt uh, uh, light bulb uh, functions by running electrical current through a resistive filament, and that filament gives off light when it's energized. The other thing it gives off uh, is a lot of heat. So with this work, we're uh, making a humorous reference to that, uh, that condition by uh, comically frying an egg on, uh, on top of the light bulb, just using the heat generated by uh, the fact that it's illuminating. So what you'll find with a, with a number of the works in this exhibition is that they highlight uh, an everyday phenomenon that we often just take for granted. We don't, we don't really notice it as we go through our day, uh, but the works here speak to these hidden sort of processes that play around us all the time. And the other uh, factor that you'll see is, um, especially with the sculptures, is that they are very performative in nature. They are not static. Uh, they, in fact, grow in cases. Uh, they uh, activate uh, and create themselves by the, uh, an idea of this uh, destruction and creation. Uh, or they're uh, capturing um, a very simple phenomenon in a, in a rather complicated way uh, as a reminder of uh, all the processes at play around us. So this work uh, here called Rememoration Peace Grass Ring is a very good example. Uh, it's a confounding of notions of nature and uh, industry. Um, the uh, factory lamp is outfitted with a full spectrum uh, grow lamp, which is a stand-in for the sun. It is in fact connected to a timer, and the timer is set to the sunrise and sunset times wherever this work is exhibited. The grass ring uh, conjures up these old world notions of nature, and in fact is composed of highly engineered grass seeds. So here where this nature cultural divide is actually being flipped on its flipped on its head by the inversion of the apparatus itself and the growth of uh, the seed grass within the ring. In referring back to the uh, title of the show uh, and the movement inherent in that investigation, these two works are really key. The photograph behind me here is called Transit, viewed through uh, processed, unexposed transparency film. It is a uh, photograph made in the deserts outside of Las Vegas during the actual 2012 transit of Venus. And you can actually, if you look very carefully, you can actually see a tiny, tiny little black dot, which is Venus across the face, uh, moving across the face of the sun. Uh, this black slide, the use of the black slide in this image is a uh, direct reference to the uh, first work that we uh, saw, the sun was born in darkness to shine for a time. So this work is a good example of, of uh, uh, cross-disciplinary uh, nature of the, my practice where uh, some works will inform other works within my practice. The video work here uh, called Torture Box is, um, was an attempt for me as an artist to viscerally uh, come up against the idea of the Earth's movement around the sun. And I uh, created a box, a sealed box, with a magnifying lens on one end, wherein when I uh, put my hand in and the hot point of light uh, from the sun would, would focus and burn across the width of my palm. Now that took about an hour and 22 minutes. And during that time, the Earth had traveled a great distance uh, at, at very high velocity. So this very simple action was, was an attempt for me as an artist to uh, witness that immense 
uh, velocity and that immense movement uh, through this painful effort. These works uh, are from a series called Via Lactea, which is the Milky Way uh, in Latin. Um, each of these uh, photographs are actually composed of hundreds and hundreds of very small exposures of the night sky. Uh, I uh, photograph these in very remote locations so there's no light pollution. And you'll find that, uh, you'll notice that we, ha we retain the film referent on all of the images. The reason I do that, and this gets back to uh, the uh, corruption of the apparatus, uh, the ideas of uh, inverting, uh, the, uh, inverting the apparatus of photography, but I want to make sure that the viewer understands that these were all uh, created on one strip of film or one segment of film. Even though it was hundreds of exposures, they were all done on the same piece of film. And so no astronomer would recognize any uh, constellations or any patterns in these night skies because they are in fact a composite of many, many hours of exposure time of the night sky. By, uh, by inverting the normal scanning and uh, printing process, I'm able to actually get a luminescent blue star field with white points of light. And it's a very simple reminder that in fact the stars are still out during the day they're just overwhelmed. We can't see them because of the presence of our own sun in the daytime sky. So as I mentioned, all of these works are created in uh, very dark sky locations. And the, the fourth work in here is a great example of that. It was shot, uh, this is my most recent work in this series. It was shot uh, in the uh, desert of uh, Nevada at an area called Massacre Rim uh, Dark Sky Preserve. Uh, this is a vast area, uh, completely barren. And, um, but the, uh, the, the clarity in the night sky is nearly unparalleled. And to give you an idea of how much effort actually goes into producing these works, um, I uh, flew, in, uh, flew into uh, Reno, I rented a, uh, I rented a vehicle, I drove for six and a half hours uh, into the desert to scout out a location that would make sense uh, with the, with the clarity and, and uh, proximity, no, that would make sense, uh, open space with a, with a great uh, sky view. And um, then on the uh, following night, uh, under very cold conditions, at one point, uh, I know the temperature had dropped to minus 11, and I had to get going back into the car to warm up, warm up again. Um, but we were ma managed to take uh, 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 about 150 exposures that first night, and then in fact, was able to repeat the process the, the following night for another 100 or 150 exposures. Uh, so this work was actually composed of, of, of uh, photography done over the course of two nights. So again, it's, it's really getting back to that experimental nature uh, within my practice and the fact that uh, I've gone to such great effort to make a photograph in which I won't even know if I've been successful until I've returned and we've, we've actually processed it. Again, remember, we're, we're using film. This isn't a digital process. So uh, when I get back, I still don't know if I've had any success. All of that effort uh, that's gone into making uh, the image, uh, all the expense and all the suffering, uh, we don't even know if it's been uh, worthwhile yet. And it isn't until the film comes back from processing and I'm able to take a look at it uh, physically to say whether I've got something I can actually use. So uh, recognizing that scale forms such a big part of many of these works, uh, this, this work in particular uh, focuses a bit more uh, locally rather than uh, the entire universe we're talking about our solar system. Uh, the work is called uh, Suns as Relative Planetary Scale. The, all of these uh, sun disk images were uh, taken from NASA's uh, Solar Dynamic Observatory. They're uh, freely accessible uh, images anyone can, um, can have a look at and download. And what I've done here is uh, stacked and layered uh, a bunch of uh, images of the sun that were all filtered through uh, different wavelengths by the, by the uh, Solar Dynamic Observatory. And, uh, I've sized them according to the relative scale of the planets in our solar system. So of course the largest one uh, being Jupiter and then Saturn and uh, Neptune and Uranus and all the way down uh, Earth 
then becomes this fourth uh, planet in. And these are mounted directly to the wall. And you'll notice also that uh, a little further out is a very thick uh, charcoal uh, line. And that line is actually uh, the relative scale of the sun in relation to the planets of our solar system. So it's a very simple work, but it, again, it points to that um, uh, immense scale uh, and size relationship within our solar system where we become uh, so much smaller when we imagine these uh, vast scales. And the, uh, that's been a, a, a bit of a, an ongoing uh, thrust of the, of the work it, that to, say, to suggest that um, as we uh, learn and understand more about the universe, about our actual cosmology, that the, the, the place of humans becomes smaller and smaller. We become much more diminutive in the grand scale of things. And that can be a uh, somewhat unnerving feeling for a lot of people. But uh, I think for me, uh, I, I find a lot of comfort in that, that there is um, this amazing uh, reality going on around us that is constantly growing in its expanse as we learn more and more about the universe. So this here is the title work of the show, uh, A Marker to Measure Drift. And it's a great example of how uh, I build a very uh, complicated sculpture, sculptural apparatus uh, to look at something, a uh, very simple phenomenon. And in this case, uh, this, this solar noon clock is uh, adjusted and tilted and oriented uh, directly to the position of our sun uh, at solar noon uh, in the, in the uh, place that it is exhibited. So the, the construction of this work is loosely based on a, an ancient device called the Antikythera mechanism, which was found uh, underwater off, uh, uh, off the coast of Greece um, about, well, many years ago. And uh, the Antikythera mechanism was uh, believed to be a, a, a very complicated uh, geared mechanism, an orrery of sorts that would uh, predict the uh, celestial patterns and positions of uh, planets and, uh, and constellations in the night sky. So uh, in following on that kind of scientific reference, this mechanism here uh, makes use of uh, some of the uh, elements uh, of uh, a vintage uh, school clock that has been reconverted to a 24-hour uh, mechanism. The uh, gold leaf references uh, some of the um, uh, familiar uh, apparatus and structure that NASA would use and build uh, for like, for instance, the lunar modules, that sort of thing, for its uh, electrical conductivity properties and also its uh, heat resistance. So the, it, there's, a, there's a lot of astronomical, loose astronomical um, uh, references uh, happening in this work. Again, uh, so a very complicated uh, structure, very complicated sculptural device for registering something as simple as the position of the sun at solar noon. So this work behind me uh, is called Omen. It's a uh, obviously very uh, large uh, photograph uh, that was shot on uh, four by five film on the west side of Bowen Island. And you'll notice that I've kept some of the film registration markers uh, in the image. You'll see the film notch codes. You'll see the clip marks uh, for the processing. And again, I uh, retain uh, those markers as a way of reminding the viewer that this is a, a, an analog photograph. It is not, uh, it's not a digital photograph. And that's very important to, to my practice in the use of the photographic apparatus and um, uh, forcing that apparatus to do certain things that are a little bit more unusual uh, from a normal photographic standpoint. Uh, the scale of this work forces the viewer, upon entering this space, uh, to be confronted by the uh, lower half of the image, which is um, a rather vague, overwhelmingly textured surface. And at first glance, it's difficult to know what we're looking at, whether it is uh, water or ice, uh, snow. It could even perhaps be sand. Uh, it isn't until uh, we are able to take in the rest of the image that we notice that it's a, uh, it's a, it's a sunset 
uh, it's a sunset image, but it's taken in black and white. So uh, we've, we've stripped uh, the normal sunset uh, of, of all color. And by using negative film, so black and white negative film, uh, what happens is that any of the highlighted areas uh, show up as black. This work was shot uh, in the uh, summer of uh, 2018. If you uh, recall, that was one of the worst forest fire uh, seasons on record to that point. And um, so at the time of taking this photograph, uh, the sky was, was, was a completely uh, blank, gray, opaque field. And the sun was just shining through as a discrete disk. It's one of the few times, it's kind of the unusual uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, heavy pollution is that you actually get really incredible sunsets. And the reason for that is that the sun is actually forced to, all that light is forced to filter through heavy particulate matter in the atmosphere. And that's the only time that you'll really see the sun like this as a discrete disk. Normally, uh, the intensity is just too overpowering to capture like that. So uh, knowing that that uh, was, would be the condition, I was actually able to take uh, a negative photograph of the sunset, uh, which would create uh, this black hole in the image uh, in place of the sun. And of course, the black hole uh, is a strong uh, reference point to astronomical discussions. Uh, we've recently um, had the first ever photograph taken of a black hole. Um, so these uh, incredibly fascinating, unknowable objects within the universe uh, is, is a very interesting uh, uh, bit of iconography for me I I photographically. One of the other aspects to this vagueness of the texture and the intense pollution of the night sky, uh, which is referring obviously to the environmental crisis that we're finding ourselves in, is uh, an idea of the hyperobject. Now, this the hyperobject is a is an entity composed of a myriad number of other entities that we can't actually get a handle on it. And climate change is a great example of something that could be termed a hyperobject. We don't know where it is, how where it exists, where the there's no single point of reference for it, and it's constantly changing. And every time we learn something more about uh, the the nature of the environment or environmental uh, destruction, um, the less we feel we know how to grapple with it. So uh, the environment would be a great example of that. And I also believe that our, our ideas of the universe as a whole is a great example of uh, something we might term the hyperobject. This is a work called The Day Breaks. Again, this is another uh, great example of a sculptural work, a rather complicated device that is really meant to uh, capture or record a very simple phenomenon. In this case, uh, this machine is witnessing uh, the passing of a day. And each of these tubes is outfitted with a uh, salvaged enlarger lens. And the light, from, uh, the light that's entering the tubes uh, through these lenses is uh, brought down uh, through some fiber optic uh, channel uh, directly in line on a uh, a hack scanner bed. And so this apparatus is actually a, a, an image making machine and it produced the nearly 50 foot long photograph that you see behind me here. The work was uh, set up about uh, two stories high on, a, on a, some scaffolding and it was oriented east to west. And so as, uh, as the day was breaking and light was entering the sky, uh, some of that light input and that color intensity would start entering into uh, the lens tubes and uh, start being registered by uh, the scan, uh, the scanner. And so each of those scans uh, was then uh, turned vertically and ganged up in order uh, side by side. And then what that, uh, what that created was this continuous uh, bell curve of the changing light intensity over the course of the day. You'll notice a couple interesting spots here uh, where the, uh, the print has gone completely white with this very hard uh, black uh, input line, uh, which doesn't really, uh, it's not very, um, it doesn't fit with the rest of the photograph. At first I thought there was something going wrong with the apparatus. Uh, 
afterwards I realized that in fact that was the moment where sun might have been directly entering into the tube and completely overwhelming the uh, scanner. And so uh, it, without that kind of uh, ability to uh, record that information, it, it, uh, it defaulted to uh, a non-exposure. And so that's where we were getting those like incredibly high uh, key points. The idea of using a very complicated device to record uh, something that happens over a very long period of time, something like uh, the changing light over the course of an entire day that no one would sit and witness uh, of themselves, is an effort to really get in touch with this uh, slow transition of phenomenon. It's the same sort of uh, uh, line of inquiry that uh, had me sit for an hour with the sun burning across my palm. One of the things you may have noticed about uh, the methodology of my practice is its very experimental nature. And part of the uh, difficulty of creating work that is so heavily experimental is that I'm never guaranteed of a result. Uh, that is true for the uh, Starfield photographs that we saw earlier, um, not knowing whether I was going to have success until the entire uh, process has been run. Um, but there are ways that I can uh, guarantee at least a little bit of uh, success. And an example of that is this test scan here. So this was the very first uh, single, uh, single scan of the corrupted scanner apparatus for the daybreaks. And I was able to uh, confirm that I would, in fact, be able to record something of the intensity of the light in the sky. So based on knowing that at least one instance of this was possible, I was uh, confident enough to move forward with building the entire apparatus, thinking that we would be able to get something that was functional and successful in the end of that. And then following on this idea of a, of a day, uh, the transition of an entire day, this is the earliest work that directly references the, uh, the Earth's movement around the sun. Uh, it's called uh, Hydropulse Shadowing after Maybridge. It's a bit of a humorous take on the pioneering fast motion photography of Edward Maybridge, a very early photographer. And it's uh, a series of eight photographs of a vacant industrial building taken on the summer solstice, or sorry, the uh, winter solstice. And the shadows of these hydropoles, which you see shifting across the facade of that building over the course of the entire day, so they were, each exposure was taken uh, uh, an hour apart uh, for the entirety of the sun on that day. You'll of course see the uh, presence of the artist, myself, in the shadows here across the front. So again, a little introduction to that, uh, of that, uh, the idea of, of the artist witnessing this passage of time, this, uh, this slow passage of time, which has uh, informed so much of the work in this show and in my practice in general, this work being one of the very earliest uh, that investigated that kind of inquiry. So this work behind me, uh, a video work called Untitled, An Object Kindly Inclining. Uh, is a great example uh, of how uh, an artwork that is seemingly so simple actually embodies a lot of uh, complicated or perhaps difficult uh, lines of thinking. It's an experimental work in the sense of being constructed out of hundreds and hundreds of different takes and then working all of those takes into a uh, seamless loop of a spinning magnifying lens on an illuminated glass surface. Ground glass lens is, is fundamentally important to my practice, not, not just through the, uh, the apparatus and the subject of photography, but also as a instrument of, a fundamental instrument of light gathering. And in fact, I, I make an argument that the ground, ground glass lens, through uh, the observations of Galileo, who was able to confirm Coperni Copernican theories of our heliocentric uh, model of the, of the solar system, uh, actually shifted uh, our cosmological thinking away from a medieval God-centered uh, line of inquiry into a science-based uh, cosmology. Wends its way uh, below the surface of a lot of my work. And I think what's important in that is that religion and, and, and science, especially astronomy and cosmology, quantum physics as well, 
are really attempting to answer very similar questions. The difference for me is that religion has already decided it's come up with some answers, whereas uh, all of the scientific inquiries of astrophysics, astrophysics today are, are, uh, are fundamentally uh, attempting to answer uh, perhaps uh, ultimately unknowable questions. Uh, what is the nature of our existence? What is the nature of the universe? How did it even come to be? Uh, science is still uh, s struggling to answer those questions, but with each new uh, discovery, we get, we get closer and closer uh, to an answer. Of course, uh, all of those answers then lead us to many more questions. So this work, uh, Simple Spinning Glass Lens, uh, refers to uh, 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 hundreds of years of scientific inquiry and dialogue uh, all pointing back to the same fundamental questions that I think we're still all thinking about today. The work behind me is called 33 Views of M33. It's another performative sculpture of sorts. The uh, light bulbs are all arranged like the Triangulum Constellation. Uh, and the Triangulum Constellation is where you're going to find galaxy M33. Uh, M33 is actually the uh, furthest object in the night sky uh, that you can see with the naked eye. Uh, so without, uh, without using a binoculars or a telescope, that would be the furthest objects in, in a dark uh, sky environment that you could see. And so M33 exists as a bit of a light pollution marker. You aren't able to actually see it uh, in, in anywhere near a, an urban environment or light polluted skies. So um, this work talks directly about uh, the effects of light pollution and how it diminishes our ability to uh, find our place in the stars. Uh, when we're removed from that, uh, from that spectacular vista, we lose a connection uh, to ourselves and, and the nature of our existence. So each of these light bulbs, which slowly dim uh, up and down, according to daylight levels outside, are engraved with a, uh, image of, a unique image of uh, galaxy M33. And so as the light bulbs slowly fade on, the image of that galaxy on the face of each of the bulbs is actually obscured. So that's that direct reference to uh, the effects of light pollution blocking out our ability to view the night sky.